Hi, uh, this is Sanjeev Agarwal, founder and CEO of M Plus Energy Solutions, which is a renewable energy platform. One minute, stop. Ready? Hold on. चलो ये कर लेते हैं दिस बी अ ग्रेट इंट्रो Our guest today belongs to that rarest of rare breed of founders who have built and scaled a business all the way to a handsome cash exit for its investors. Sanjeev Agarwal decided to quit his job because of a fundamental problem he saw in how India's power sector works. But having an insight does not lead to a business and it took him many years and multiple pivots to finally discover product market fit with Amplus Solar, which is Asia's leading rooftop solar power generation company. And in 2019, his persistence paid off when Amplus Solar was acquired by the Malaysian petroleum giant Petronas for rupees 2,700 crores. Here, Sanjeev telling Akshay Dutt about his amazing journey of building and scaling up Amplus Solar. From the campus placement, I got placement in SBI Capital Markets, which has investment banking subsidiary of the State Bank of India, and that we started working straight away on the. project financing of power projects so that was the initiation into the power sector so the first job sometimes is often it is beyond control what type of job you will got you will get what profile you will get in the company where you join so it became all like a probably something which was scripted in some sense that okay you will start working in the power sector and you will start working on this type of thing and then one thing led to another and i continued working in the power sector on various things right from project financing into project development into the consulting side and finally in 2010 after going through four or five jobs by that time we started it so like you would be working with the like government companies or like private infrastructure players for their so project development was happening with the last job uh, which i did well with aes aes corporation is one of the largest ipps in the world and the us based company listed on new york state stock exchange a fortune 200 company so i was heading the india business development from 2004 to 2010 at between sbi caps and aes i worked also with crisil heading their power practice consulting i also worked in europe on some of the power trading assignments so these were like some couple of the things that i did between those 15 years so an ipp is a independent power producer oh, that's absolutely. the okay and they would be selling to the discoms the, the state state owned uh, distribution yeah, company correct so what made you feel that you want to quit your job and take that risk of starting up becoming an entrepreneur so i think two things which sort of always reasonably excited me was that one that you find that you want you're not always happy with the workplace because you are you find that there are a lot of policies which are not to the liking of people so can you create a very differentiated workplace where people really like to come and work so that was one of the things the second thing is that while you have done whatever you've done in the job is it happening because you are getting the strength of an organization or is it happening partly because of you also so it's a test of yourself so do you want to go out and try that am i a reflection of the car that i'm carrying or am i a reflection of myself but 2010 you know the whole concept of quitting a job and starting up was not socially acceptable also and uh, i'm sure you would have been married by then with some family commitments also and how did you justify it to people around you that what is it you want to do and why you're taking that risk so i don't think i had to really justify to anyone i think it's more like when you're taking the decision obviously you have the family commitments and you want to make sure that whatever your things are there you are able to take care of those so i was reasonably sure that i'll be able to take care of those things for say like next two years but well, either i make it work in next two years or do i have enough skills enough experience to go back into the job market and take a job there is no certainty that you will ever succeed right so you need to have a you don't need to be heroic you don't need to be saying no no i'm going to change the world you need to be practical about the whole thing and think that okay i will go ahead and try it and i have got some sort of a financial cushion to handle this next 2 3 years and during this period if we are successful great if you're not successful then what is my backup plan will i be starving to death after that if i'm failing or will i get a job back so with a 15 years of experience and a good educational background you can be reasonably assured that you may not find a job of 100% you may find a job 70% is that 70% enough for me to survive yes it is so therefore go ahead mm, okay and what was the opportunity you saw 
that you wanted to, that made you feel that yes i can build a business in this space i see this opportunity yeah, so i think the opportunity was there that having seen the distribution companies and the power sector for last 15 years one of the thing which was continuing and it still continues is about the financial condition of the distribution companies you they don't make enough money they spend more on their expenses side than what they make on the revenue side. In some form, they are like... Subsidized a, by the government. Yeah. In some form, they are slow form of e-commerce. So in some form, they continue to spend more than what they were earning. And they continue to do that. So if you want to work in that industry where your off-taker is not able to make your ends meet, you can't survive as a supplier. You are in the bad industry. So therefore, what will you do? So what you want to do is to find out the customers who can actually pay for it. Who are those customers? So we said like, okay, there are customers, there are consumers, large consumers who want to purchase power directly. And there is a regulation, there is a regulatory system, there is a policy framework, which actually enables that. Can we actually make it happen by supplying electricity directly to some of these customers and say that, okay, now I am your supplier. I'm also part of your supplier and I will give you power cheaper than what your alternate cost is. So obviously it makes huge sense for them to purchase from us. But the challenges still remain to manage the regulatory and the policy framework around that. That was the business opportunity in my mind, reaching out directly to the customer. So was this allowed in black and white that an IPP or independent power producer can directly sell to let's say uh, large manufacturers or large power consuming companies? Yeah, yes, this was there under the 2003 Electricity Act. There is a provision for providing open access and purchase of power directly. But often the frameworks are there, but you need to get them really implemented. And how would it be implemented? It's just about running a line from the IPP to the plant? Yeah, so it sounds very simple that you can set up a power plant, you can set up a transmission line and start giving electricity to them. But in practice, it is much more difficult because you are like working with an incumbent utility and the customer is already buying from them. So what you're trying to do is to take away some of their customers who are high paying customers. And therefore you will find quite a bit of the regulatory hassles. So you need to create a full framework to make it work alongside. You can't simply say that I will be here and I will be fighting with you and I will be supplying electricity. So that cannot happen. No, but uh, tell me what exactly you need to do to make this kind of a commercial arrangement work out? So that, I think the fortunately what one thing which happened in the renewable space, the government also became little more tolerant of promoting the renewable energy and said that, okay, if you want to supply renewable energy, we will provide you some extra regulations which can make this happen. So, so the regulations happened in that sense that you can set up the rooftop plants, you can do the net metering of those plants. You can set up open access, large plants. You can use our transmission system to transmit the electricity. So those types of regulations came into effect during that period. And that's how a lot of customers were actually able to procure electricity from us. Okay. So your uh, original concept when you quit was that you want to figure out a way for an IPP to supply. And you wanted to be like a platform that works with IPPs on one hand and large consumers on the other hand or you wanted to set up your own IPP and own IPP like a trader okay so when did you figure out that you need to pivot into renewable and you know tell me that journey from launch to making that pivot yeah. so 2010 was the time when M plus was uh, started initially I was working on coal based plants because coal was the flavor of the season and that was the only thing that I actually knew so we are working on some like a hundred megawatt, 200 megawatt type of coal plants and saying that, okay, we'll sell to the steel mill. We'll sell to a refinery or we'll sell to a cement plant. So can there be these smaller plants, but these are either within their campus, we sell electricity to them. But since 2010, after that, there were no new coal plants which are allowed because the coal linkages were never given up. This was an on paper plan you made, like when you say you were working on yeah. coal plant, means you made like a project plan and then you would have gone to a bank open. We just you know, went out, but not to the banks, when you go first to the customers, you try to find out where the plant can be set up, how you will get coal, etc. Because if everything looks proper, only then you go to the bank. Banks are not going to let you on day one. There has to be a project for that. So that was thinking during say initial six, nine months and that very quickly fizzled out because whole thing some completely imploded of the whole thing. 
because <laughs> there was no access to coal L- like access to coal is uh, the key thing to Tom did stop that coal linkage allocation because of various controversies around that time yeah there was some scam also right around coal procurement coal blocks were allocated and there were a lot of controversy and disputes around those things so and the government said like we are not giving any further coal allocations unless this dispute is resolved in between so around 2011 the new thing which came in town was reliance announcement of a big gas finding in pg6 basin so i said like okay this looks like a good opportunity so why don't we set up a gas based plant the coal is not happening also started working on a gas plant and developed probably one of the last plants which were being set up for the gas so we had the environmental clearance we had gas allocation but suddenly the gas vanished so reliance announced we miscalculated and the gas is not there so probably another 6 9 months were spent on that thing and then you all this while you were essentially like a solo entrepreneur like this would have been like i not exactly solo i won't say solo so i always had few people two three people but very specific to the technology very specific to the type of thing that we were doing so when i was working on the coal plants so we had people who were experienced on the coal side technical side some people who were working on the development side some people who are experienced on the gas side so because i am not a technical person myself despite being an engineer so we need and particularly when you're going out to the investors and to the banks you need to have a full team with a full capability you can't say that i am the only one who will pull the whole thing through nobody will need you right? you're not a unless you are a elon musk <laughs> so things happen over a period of time then after gas it was more moving towards renewable so wind was the first thing that we tried and wind was we saw a little more success than the first two ones the coal didn't happen gas saw a little bit of success wind saw a little more success that at least the gas remained on paper or did you like actually so the project uh, it got all the approvals etc but then it remained on paper and then pivoted towards wind wind was getting more traction from the investing community from the private equity investors and all that so wind we did even more work and it almost reached to the extent of getting a like 200 million dollar commitment from a large private equity fund and then for the i r looks like now things are sorted probably you never know the latter and that was the time when i had guru in the join me guru who was working with me and then he had more experience in renewable than i had so obviously it was a good thing to have him on board but unfortunately wind also could not happen because why is that but i think the issue became more like the timing issue we ended up uh, investing quite a bit of money in procuring or like trying to do a buyout of a wind project and the final commitment from the private equity fund that we were speaking with did not happen so it led to quite a bit of a financial setback also but then we said it's probably not prudent to be completely dependent on the external capital providers to do something that you want to do you need to take some steps and show things on the ground before people can completely trust you and give you the value for that so that's how we moved finally into the rooftop projects so rooftop projects by definition are very small and one can actually with a 50 lakh rupees type of capital one can set up a plant so that's how we started so we collected some almost 2 crore rupees from various friends and family and loan resources whatever left and said okay, okay let's set up two crores of this money it is another four five crores from the banks and do the initial one or two megawatt and i think that became little bit of a turning point and also mix of various things including that the pricing of solar was coming down there was more desire from the government side to promote solar and the companies and the corporates are looking to procure more of renewable energy so a lot of things have to fall in place and then these things started falling in place like what yeah. one question here uh, you said pricing of solar started coming down uh, how is that a plus uh, because that would mean your realization yeah because you're selling to the customers directly and the customers will always compare it with the alternate cost right so if my alternate cost is cheaper than what the grid cost is if i'm giving them solar cheaper than the grid cost then only it makes sense for that and why was pricing coming down so it was more like the economies of scale in the module manufacturing in china so the cost of the investment needed to set up that plant was getting lower and lower you didn't have to invest so much upfront money to set up uh, okay if you really look at between 2011 and 2017 18 the costs of solar modules came down by almost 80% so it was on a downward slope 
at that time. So it started making sense for customers to buy this electricity directly from us. And we said, you don't need to worry about the technology risk. You don't need to worry about the capital risk. You consume your electricity in the format that you have been doing it. And we will take all this risk. We'll set up the plant for you and we will just uh, sell you the electricity under a long-term contract. So it's like a no-brainer type of a thing. If you look from a customer perspective that is not taking away anything from me, I don't have to invest anything. Did you discover this model right in the first project you did or was this an evolution? No, to from the first this? project itself. From the first project okay. itself. What was, was the first project? The, like, tell me that the story of the first project. Who was the, the customer? The first project we did was with an engineering college in Nagpur, college called Rangsoni, GH Raisoni Engineering College. And the promoter there, Sunil Raisoni, is a fairly forward-looking person. And he had been thinking about solar, that we should do solar, because like it's in the newspaper, people read it, and who are progressive people will also realize that there can be something about it. Then somehow through a connect, we reached out to him, and then I told him that we will do this thing for you and you don't even have to spend your money. So he liked the idea and we started setting up the first plant, which was like 100 kilowatt. So for him, he will continue as an OPEX model. He just needs to pay yeah. per unit consumed. Plus he needs to give you space. He would not charge you for space, right? The space he can charge from us, but then we'll charge him back. Okay, okay. The OPEX will go up. And what is the way in which this arrangement happens? Is it like a cost plus kind of a negotiation on... What is the price per unit or no, how does like that? It's more like a negotiation, which is bilateral negotiation. It's more like a buyer and seller type of thing. What you think is the value of the whole thing. And you will have various methods of triangulation of the whole thing that what makes sense. You will think, okay, this is what, if I have to set it up, this is what will cost me. If I'm buying electricity from there, this is what is going to cost me. If I know correctly, this is the capital cost, how much returns he is making. So you'll do all those calculations mentally and not like a open book type of a thing that I actually tell you my cost. But that doesn't matter to them. As long as it's cheaper than grid, that would be the main thing. But you know the minds of the buyers, you always try to back calculate. So, and like your own savings must have got totally used up by this time, right? Those three years in which you yeah, were yeah. trying to do gas yes, and wind and coal. Right, yeah, yeah. So borrowings were full swing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you didn't want to give up. It could have happened, right? Like it could have happened. If it didn't happen, it could have happened. In the sense, like you always look at the next day and see if there is a progress happening. Is it worthwhile to continue or are you seeing that it doesn't happen? And then you take the plan to other people that this is what we are doing. Are you willing to invest some more money? If you continue to see that interest, that gives you that confidence that you are probably on the right track. I guess solar as an industry also was getting a lot of action in those days and therefore there would have been an yeah. investor in terms of the angel investment that you got, there would have been some like positive interest because of the solar. Yeah, so obviously people want to understand the so the industry that you're working in and with, when they're looking at as the whole as the angel investor. They probably don't know the whole brass tags about whether they go by what you're telling them. Now, it depends on your own honesty and the transparency, what you're really telling them. So people need to trust you. That becomes really the important point there because the same story can be told by two people. One people will invest, other people will not invest. And that's where the it comes about the credibility point. So this college in Nagpur, what kind of revenue started once you implemented this? How much did this cost you? These are like no revenues. There. It's like a investment was some 75 lakhs or 80 lakh. And probably the revenue one will make out of that project will be say 15 lakh rupees a year. That's not something which is going to be super helpful from a continuity perspective. But you have a 15 year contract now. And you do like four or five contracts like that, you can go out and show to the investor that this is a proven model. The proof of concept is there and there is a large market which can be handled through this particular model. And that became the pitch going forward. And that's how we finally were able to get the investment done by I square. Okay. So after this uh, Nagpur College project, you got the investment? We got few more projects we did with Domino's. Domino's would have been their manufacturing setup or something. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Office. Well, then it happened for, I think, because we were talking to Yamaha at that time, we had Harry Potter. So there are four or five good names. So that gave the confidence that people who are high quality customers are interested in buying it. And there is a sort of a solution which has been implemented and which can be implemented. At there are like multiple pieces of the puzzle you need to solve. One is, of course, you need to get, you need to convert a customer 
who agrees yeah. to the project then you need to execute in terms of that yeah. whole project management to set up a plant and mm. then you need to have a successful commercial arrangement in place tell me about each of these pieces what was your strategy to get customers how hard or easy was it to do that execution of the project once it came in were things available off the shelf was the ecosystem in place or like did you have to do a lot of things from scratch so then so i think from the customer perspective it is a you have to reach out to many customer customers take time to decide so you need to have a good pipeline of customers to really do that and at in those times it was like the only the more progressive customers will go for it because for people it was a very very new thing and a lot of customers will actually come back and say like oh okay so you are going to set up a plant for me and you are going to charge me less than that and i don't have to pay anything for that So what is the catch? Yeah, what is the catch? Okay. So it sounds too good to be true. So what is the catch there? Because people didn't understand how the whole thing is that, and then they will go back, and this is not something which is on the priority list for them to get it implemented because they are anyway getting the electricity. So is it going to make a difference to their life? Probably not. So they will take their own sweet time to decide, and you have to be literally on their toes to say like. Okay, now we need to decide and you have to keep on following is like a typical sales process so obviously it's not something which you can do on day one and expect things to happen very very fast so there has to be one set of people who are on the business development side or the sales side and then you will find once the project has been signed up you need to find out who are the people who are going to execute it so execution will also have multiple challenges right from designing of the plant from the procurement of the equipment and then constructing the whole thing and then finally operating it so you need to have people who can potentially take care of that aspect and then we will have people who are going to also finance so you need to also go back to the banks and get your whole project financed that is just we yeah. are so multiple things have to it's like a full business you can't say that i will do this i will not do this etc so it's a just a, i think a, a full organization that you have to Build around this. So every project needs to be financed. L- like you would not use your own equity capital for. You have to use the equity to construct the plant, but eventually you also need to take it to the banks to get the funding done. Because with hundred percent equity, things may not be as attractive. Okay, and it'll scale very slowly then, because then you are constrained by how much equity you have. Correct, and your returns will always be suboptimal. Hmm. Okay. So, what you explained to me, the uh, commercials for that first college project, it seems like the payback starts only after about eight years, or like you spent seventy-five lakhs. Correct. So you will probably just recover the money in the first six, seven years, and then you make your returns. Th- that sounds uh, low, uh, or is it the norm? That's normally the norm in the infrastructure projects. So typically, the contract periods are fifteen to twenty-five years. depending on the contract duration your payback will vary from 5 to 6 7 8 years and then you actually make that returns okay, okay so infrastructure projects by nature are like long term revenue correct projects correct. that's the whole thing that you have a long term thing but you always look at the full duration irr you don't look at like the what it looks like in first year or second year the assumption being that the whole contract will last so there's basically for investors who want long term low risk opportunities because once you've installed a physical infrastructure then that's not going anywhere the customer can't just replace you so so your commercial risk is much lower correct that's the basic premise of the whole thing of course assumptions in some cases will not be that true okay so uh, tell me about the the first institutional fundraise then when that happened what scale were you at what was the inst- installed capacity it, i i guess growth for you would be measured in terms of megawatts of capacity installed capacity what are the metrics you would show to investors yeah yeah so i think the capacity is one parameter and uh, obviously you need to ascertain at the project level that every project remains profitable because every project is a unit by itself so you will keep on growing that thing and then i think it close to something like 2 megawatt when we got the funding round done by i squared capital which was the private ad but before that we also did some debt from reliance capital before even they came in the everything was sort of proven at that time that there is a customer who wants to buy the solution there is a banker who wants to fund it there is an implementation which is possible so when you are going to the investors you need to show all the thing that this is a doable thing and how much did you raise from i squared so we went to them to raise around 20 25 million dollars 
and they came back hey, we want to give you 150 million dollars wow <laughs> <laughs> okay so that was a nobody says no to that but i just wanted to understand that why do you want to actually commit more i think the couple of reasons that they said that uh, we want to build this as a reasonably large platform and second that uh, i think we trust the team that you will be able to do a good job so we don't want you to keep on coming back or going to other people for raising money at future date so probably this is thought like this is a too good an opportunity so why don't we just put all our money there rather than somebody else come so uh, i squared is what is it like a typical vc or is it more infrastructure yeah, it's a fund is a infrastructure fund and uh, which is based out of us at that time it was around 3 billion dollar now they are close to 20 billion dollars fairly large sum now okay and uh, i guess that would have meant that they would have got a majority stake or something like that when they put it yeah, yeah of course so i think that was one of their key drivers that obviously these guys are coming with like a 2 crore of capital equity capital and i am putting 1000 crores <laughs> so, the balance is of the are completely tilted in their favor but at the same time the way you balance is because you are going to run the whole thing so the success of their money depends on your efforts so you have to find out a balance between the two okay so tell me how the trajectory changed then once that deal got signed tell me the story from there yeah so the couple of things happened one thing that actually happened was that it provided access to the capital and that made it feasible for us to really go out in the market with much more confidence because earlier we were always like thinking about okay if i sign it where the capital is going to come from is the first second it became easier for us to get and hire more people to build in house capabilities some of things which were getting out so at that time you could build some of those things as the in house capability third i squared as a firm i think is a great investor and they brought in quite a bit of corporate governance and the best practices which helped the company to really scale up so it's not like a really dumb capital type of mm. what were those things that were getting outsourced which you wanted to bring in house give me example so for example the construction capabilities some of the procurement capabilities things like that so whatever you want to build and see like what are the capabilities that we need internally to scale up those types of things. building the internal monitoring systems like how can we really evaluate the performance of all our plants those types of thing okay tell me about the technology that goes into setting up a plant there is of course the physical infrastructure you would need those photovoltaic receptors i guess that they are called which absorb the sunlight so just talk to me about the whole you know for an outsider who doesn't understand how this works how sunlight is converted into electricity i can tell you all the scientific and the technical thing around it but essentially these are like the photovoltaic cells so as the irradiation or the sunlight falls on these cells so there is a movement of these electrons within that thing and that starts creating an electric current and that electric current is captured and then you this is generated in the form of dc power then you use an inverter to convert this into an ac and then ac power is something which you consume in your houses daily so it's as simple as that If you like to hear stories of founders then we have tons of great stories from entrepreneurs who have built billion dollar businesses just search for the founder thesis podcast on any audio streaming app like spotify gana apple podcasts and subscribe to the show but you would have put in iot devices which would be giving you data to help you optimize utilization or even for yeah, like the billing and thing so tell me about like those pieces of technology in this i think those are the important pieces when you're trying to do anything at scale so the this business is also we were expecting this to become at a scale because of the simple reason that if you're working in a very distributed format of working with lot of customers then you need to have a system where you are able to scale up with the help of technology and not necessarily depend on the manpower because that's like a absolutely unworkable thing so that is not going to really take you very far so the first thing or the thing that we started doing from the very initial stages was to implement the erp system implement the monitoring system to reduce the overall human power dependence put all our systems and processes in that format that you are actually able to implement the plants in a schedule which is 
completely monitorable. We are able to monitor the performance, monitor the progress of the construction of the plants, and to do that with a minimal amount of manpower. So those were the things that we started putting the ERP systems and the IoT systems in the plant so that we could actually scale it up. Of course, of course, there are many, many details in that one and probably not really, may not be that much of interest to your listeners, not too many, but, uh, and these are very detailed. So basically, uh, this investment would help you to reduce time and it's money. Yeah, so it's basically to scale up the business. Now, scaling up the business is one part that one can keep on setting up the plants in a very manual and a with a brute force type of a thing that I keep on growing it linearly. One project I get, I put four people behind it. I get next one, I put another four people behind it. Or can I do 15 projects with say 10 people? So that's where the management comes into picture. So there can be two ways of using the capital. One to just put it very linearly and not so efficient manner. That is to use some of the system processes and technology to make it very, very efficient. And how did you make it efficient? System processes. So you put the team structures, the system, the uh, technology part of it. So everything has to work as like a full jigsaw puzzle or like a clockwork type of thing. So everything feeds into each other. So it's a good mix of the people and technology that you need to create along with the processes so that people can actually implement it. Essentially, you would have created like a playbook for installing a new project and therefore that playbook could then be digitized into a workflow and then it was just about checking each step, this step done. And whenever there's a deviation, it would show up in some sort of a report. Your dashboards uh, are able to see what is happening, which are the projects which are falling behind, those types of things. So you start managing by exceptions, not managing by rule. And how do you do maintenance of a plant? Like once a plant is set up, does it need maintenance? How does that happen? So of course the plant needs maintenance. So there is like a very basic type of a cleaning that needs to be done of the van. That's the one part of it. To maintain that the panels are able to absorb as much irradiation as it can. Because ultimately, that is your raw material. And if there is dust on the panel, you will not be able to absorb it. So this would be like a daily cleaning? Not daily. You need to do it at some set frequency. And that's where, again, we use the IoT in that thing. To actually monitor how much loss is happening because of the dust. And what is the cleaning cost? At some stage, these curves cross each other. So that is the right frequency to go for any particular plant. You can't just simply say, I will start cleaning it every day because then the cost becomes too high. Or I will not clean it for two months because the cost is high, but then the loss may be too high. You start using technology in that form. Hmm. Okay. Uh, you were telling me the other things needed for maintenance. So when is this cleaning the dust? So the other things that you have to do maintenance to make sure that all your cables, connectors, your structures, etc. are intact and do a, like a six monthly testing of those things. Okay. Uh, and this would be a manual process, obviously, this kind of six monthly testing. Yeah, so that will be a preventive maintenance, will be more like a SLA driven that, okay, this is the checklist to be checked for people to go and do it. Again, the use of technology so that people are routinely informed that now you need to go to this plant, then once you go to the plant, fill this checklist. Right, right. So only these are the two things which are needed for from a maintenance perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Unless there is something other thing happens, like there is some major breakdown somewhere, some inverter is pumped or things like that. Okay, the electrical failure, like the equipment failure, basically. So tell me the growth part then once I squared invested, you told me two megawatts at that. So point. I squared in 2015 June. And then from that point, we kept on growing. I think the first year we were like some 20, 30 megawatt, probably 30 or 40 megawatt. And the next year, it became some 70, 80 megawatt. And the third year, we started setting up the larger projects. And then you're like crossing almost 200 megawatt. And by 2018, we were in the age of around 300 megawatt. And that's when the discussions with Petronas started happening. In between also, there were some other potential buyers, but Petronas was the most serious one. And then we started discussing with them. They started discussing around somewhere mid of 2018 and took almost nine months to complete the whole thing by 2019 March. And at that time, we were like 375 megawatt. So because uh, I squared was private equity, so it was very clear from very early days, I guess, that eventual goal would be for an exit for them. Is that why the talks were happening around the sale? The IPO could also have been one route or staying private with I squared also could have been one route. Why was this option getting explored? Eventually, 
private equity by definition remains something which they need to return capital to their own investors, to their own LPs. So they have to exit at some stage. Now, what the right kind of exit is depends on the type of business and the type of industry and the opportunity that are there. From a company perspective, like Amplus, probably you need to find out a home of your own. So whether it happens as a standalone entity or whether it becomes by merger with a strategic player. So I think to make a home of your own, you need to become fairly large and do an IPO, etc., etc. So those options always remain open. But at times, if you find somebody who can provide you enough capital to continue your growth and also maintain your independence and identity, I think that's not a bad out. So, yeah, I was saying for Petronas, the idea must have been to diversify into green energy. Yeah, so if you look at from Petronas' perspective, it's an oil and gas company and say fossil fuel company. And there has been a significant movement towards all of the large companies to do something about the climate change. And so much more pressure on the oil and gas companies. And so people are being forced by their shareholders and the finances that you have to do something. And that's where I think Petronas also took a call that we want to go at this thing. And then they decided that we want to do to renewables. So they looked around across Asia, zero down on India. Probably they met some 20 companies in India. And finally, zero down on M plus that this is a transaction that we want to do. Okay. And what are the kind of customers who are from the 2 watt to 300 megawatt journey when Petronas acquired? You must have figured out who are the customers who are most likely to go for this kind of an arrangement. What are those key factors which make it a successful arrangement for a customer? So tell me about that. Like, I think the type of customers that typically you will find in this segment are the multinational companies. Because for them, the green energy is one criteria, one important criteria for them to show that they are again doing something about the renewable energy or carbon offset. So those were the initial adopters. But as the things became more commonplace, some of the larger Indian companies start coming into the picture and saying that we also are open to this thing. But from our customer base, probably is still 70, 75% electricity sold to multinational companies. Okay. So uh, the green tag is like the biggest factor to drive sales, like, like companies which want a green tag. Green tag is something which starts to, like when, that's where people really start to look at this thing. But then as it moves down to the operations people and the people who are handling the P&L, for them the cost also is a parameter. So if I say that I will give you green energy, but I will charge you one rupee more, there are no takers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I say I'll give you green energy and you say one rupee, there are many takers. This is that. What I'm wondering is if as a business, I am saving money for free, literally. I mean, there is no capital outlay from my side, which is needed, then why... Isn't this a much more common place? So it is getting common. It was like for various reasons, people were not adopting it. So some of the reasons people have been thinking about, will it get further cheap? Will it get cheaper? That is one reason. Second reason, a lot of the Indian companies don't end up doing it. Should we do it ourselves? Oh, okay. okay Rather okay. than somebody else making this money. Should we do it ourselves? And I think these are the two main reasons apart from just the simple management inertia. Because not on the bloody list. Your, your clients would have to be like large enterprise clients only. This, I mean, the, the, those are the kind of clients which you would focus on, right? Correct. From our perspective, from the security of our investment perspective, that is an important. Like, what is the size of companies that you would typically focus on? We don't go by the size of the companies. We go more by the rating of a company, not so much of the credit rating, because credit rating is one part of it. We do something completely internally, which is like the creating a credit profile of every customer and saying that this is something somebody who is acceptable to us or not. So because this can be only one criteria, we don't even look at the, whether it's a profit making or loss making. For example, if you look at someone like an Amazon in India, it's a loss making entity. So if I put one simple criteria that company should be making profit, then you never end up doing for Amazon. But can we do for Amazon? Absolutely, yes. Right. Hmm. So, 
why do you do this due diligence? Did you like burn your fingers where some customer became an... No, to avoid burning the fingers. It's pretty obvious that, right, you are setting up the plant for someone which is dedicated for them. And if this person doesn't pay you, then what do you do? Because your yes. payback will only start after seven, eight years. So you no, need even to... in the first two or three years, whenever, even if it doesn't pay, then who is at risk? We are at risk. Before you want to make sure that this guy is good in terms of his corporate governance, his own business is strong, and he has all the intentions to pay. And then obviously you sign a contract where a worst case scenario one can go for a legal route. But you don't want to take that route. Right. So what if uh, a business goes bankrupt where mm -hmm. you have an arrangement with them? Is it like pay for use only? So if they stop using, if they stop drawing electricity, then... If they go out of the business, right? So if somebody's business gets shut down, so we always tell them that we are your partners. So if you are shutting down your business in India and you have no other claim to no other place to relocate this plant, then we are happy to let you go off free, free of cost. We'll take away your plant. No problems. So that's where our diligence comes into picture that to make sure that these are the guys who will remain in business. Mm, okay. So how did the things change once Petronas came in? And Petronas is now like a, a, a is it like fully owned by Petronas? Or, and how much did the value Amplus at? So I don't, uh, I can't really tell you, but it's in the public domain. Yes, yes. Okay. So tell me the story once Petronas came in, like how did things change after that? I think one of the things which Petronas liked about Amplus was the overall work culture. And we take a lot of pride in the work culture in terms of how people are, are treated and how people are given the responsibility here. So we have some of the very interesting practices like we had like unlimited leave we had a no check-in check-out time type of thing so we had things like okay you can work from home as many days as you want this is like on pre-covid i'm talking not post -COVID. these are the things which are happening at that time so we literally had no leave register so for someone like petronas it was like a good culture shock and but at the end of the day, what they started liking about the company was that in the company, everybody was so empowered. Everybody was so much aware of what's happening. They said that this is the company which will really grow. And this is the company where we feel most comfortable in terms of the culture. Because business, many companies do. But where do you get the right culture? Okay. And that 300 megawatt when Petronas acquired, what is that number today? Did you continue to grow during COVID or uh, I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah, we just continue. We, continue. we are now over, I think, 1100 of megawatts. So it's almost three times of when Petronas came in. Wow. Okay. Okay. That's like massive growth, like in the last two years, basically. Yeah, yeah. Last three years. So, so we continued with our own thing. And I think during COVID, etc., didn't really impact us that much because we kept business largely as much normal as we could. But I think uh, I have a firm belief that you just can't stop. You have to find out the opportunity during these times also because there is a way to do business. Either you can just sit back and start blaming the world, okay, Chinese have put the COVID here and this is happening. Yes, 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 yes. The government is not doing this. Government is not giving us money, or you find out a way to do. So, how did you change the way you do business to, to deal with the COVID situation? So, I think the initial few days were little suddenly because the lockdown, like many other things, uh, was very sudden, and therefore we immediately started getting the, at least the top twenty percent of the team together of the Zoom calls and started discussing about what can be done now that you can't really move out of the house. We started working on some of the pending internal systems and processes that can be make them more efficient during this period of whenever it lasts. Till we are not even allowed to go out. So we really started working on some of those things which have been which would not have been done in those normal times. So those things started taking shaping up. Some of the things started getting automated. Things started happening, people still remain like on a, we used to have like almost two or three times in a week, the Zoom calls, people were 
having the calls in their own smaller groups. So things kept on moving, didn't stop. So whatever we could do without interacting with the outside world, so those things you fix. And then as things started a little bit opening up, we started moving out our list of food. Now construction operations resume. Electricity was also an essential commodity. So therefore, the movement was easier for our people. So things kept on moving. And from a consumer perspective, from the customers also started realizing that during this period, we need to find out every possible way of saving. So a lot of people for whom the solar was a little bit at the back of the burner came in front. And they also started deciding about the whole thing. I think overall you have to find out and be in front of the customer with your solutions, even during the tougher times. You have to find out what works. Okay. The customer demand did not see a dip. See, the interaction obviously saw a dip, and but there is a more receptiveness. Let's say, for example, there is a corporate park where your plant is installed and because of COVID, there is work from home and so therefore ACs are not running, for example. So there is less power consumption. So what happens in yeah. such a scenario that, that that hit is yours, like the less power consumption? So we have this facility called net metering. So whatever electricity is being generated gets pumped back to the grid. So we get the credit of that in the later period. Now, if there was no consumption for one year, that would have been a loss. But because things kept on going up and down, so that electricity got consumed eventually. But in some cases, like the educational institutions, like the colleges, schools, etc., which remained shut, there it became a problem. So in some of those cases, we had to let go of that electricity. Like when you send the power to the grid, you get paid for it or... Uh... Your electricity you are sending out, you get the electricity in lieu of that. Okay, 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 okay. Got it, got it. So you are able to track this and then your customer will still pay you even if they have not used it at that time. Okay. Yeah, they will use it sometime later. Okay. Is there an opportunity for excess power to also be sold to other customers or back to the grid if there is a, a plant which is making more than what the customer needs? Does that ever happen? That is not allowed. Uh, okay. The regular okay. system. And do you also, so you don't really need to worry much about storage, right? Because whatever excess is getting produced will go up to the grid and therefore that right. is, yeah, it's like a virtual storage. Yes, that's right. Okay. 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 And what do you see happening today that 300 to 1100 jump? Is this largely driven by the cost cutting drive or is it that more companies are now getting environment conscious and there is that whole ESG drive. I think more of the ESG drive, people getting more comfortable with the technology, higher adoption rates. So Mm. basically, Mm. like mix of everything. Okay, because I think ESG, uh, is ESG significant in India? Like I know in the West, like if you have ESG credentials, then as an organization, you can raise funds with lower rate of interest and your cost of borrowing comes down if you have ESG credentials. Because there are lenders who are willing to subsidize you for ESG. Is that the case in India also? Is ESG big in India? Yeah, what? There are some funds which are like the ESG funds, right? And so these ESG funds are investing and providing capital to the companies which are more focused on the ESG side. But I think it's a little bit of a difficult thing to measure. So the measurement of the ESG remains a challenge. But of course, there's a global and as well as in India, there's a good interest in the ESG type of way. And ESG goes beyond just simple renewable energy. This includes so many other things. Mm. So what do you think is in the roadmap for Amplus now? What's the path ahead? Are you looking to also diversify outside India or into other spaces beyond rooftop solar? That has already started with Petronas. Uh, even before Petronas, we had gone into Middle East. With Petronas coming in, we obviously are able to provide more services in Malaysia. Petronas is also considering setting up a dedicated unit for handling the clean energy transition, which will include renewable, which will include electric mobility and hydrogen. Therefore, the opportunities for employers also in India will be much larger, including things like getting into the utility scale, getting into green hydrogen, 
We are also doing some work on the electric mobility side. So these are the things which will keep on opening up. So we remain a more a player in the energy transition. What are some of those projects you're doing like in mobility? Mobility, for example, we are providing vehicles to our existing customers like Amazon, Big Basket, etc. Saying that, okay, these are the electric vehicles that you're providing to you. And service again, in the sense that we are owning the things and we are giving it on lease to them or some third party operators who provide service to them. And this in itself is a pretty large business, right? Like, yeah, yeah. So this is potentially can be a fairly large business as the electric mobility becomes more commonplace. So it's important for a oil and gas company also to understand where their demand is shifting. But do you have uh, aggressive plans for this? Because this by itself can become like a unicorn of its own in a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. So I think that the plans are there depends on the ecosystem because the ecosystem also includes manufacturing of good quality vehicles. If that ecosystem kicks in only then the adoption and the reliability will be of high level. Unless that happens, people won't be able to fund to a very large extent. Hmm. And uh, what are the other initiatives? Besides on the mobility. We're also working on the residential solar. So which becomes like even smaller plants. So we are setting up for the sim, like the household setting up on their roofs and trying to see how can we give them a product, which is more aesthetic as compared to the normal solar plant, because this is not something like industrial use. This is something for a outdoor. Can we make it more like a lifestyle type product? And we also help them in getting more information about their energy consumption patterns. So those are some of the things which we're working at the tail level. Okay. This would need a very different kind of an organization to deal with it, right? You would probably need to make it more self-service because if you were to maintain it, then that might become very expensive. For you to maintain a one megawatt plant, the efficiency is much higher than maintaining multiples. Yeah, yeah. so these residential plants we sell. We don't uh, sign the PPA. There's something additional that we sell. Okay. We don't get into that electricity. Mm. The mm. is a huge batch. And uh, what is the cost of this? So it depends. I think the cost has been varying now. I think it's like per kilowatt around 40, 45,000. And like say for a three-story building, how many kilowatts would they need? Depends on the rooftop available. We will consume much more than what the rooftop can support. Okay. And is there a government subsidy? The government has at least said that they want to give 30% subsidy for the residential. So, so if that is available. Yeah, I think that is something which can be definitely available by the individual customers. So this becomes like Tesla has that division of rooftop solar. So this would be like the Indian version of that. If you like the Founder Thesis podcast, then do check out our other shows on subjects like marketing, technology, career advice, books, and drama. Visit the podium.in, that is T H E P O D I U N dot I N for a complete list of all our shows.